One day after Valentine's Day, you know what time it is. It's NXT Vengeance Day. Let's get in. Welcome everybody, this is Tap Out Talk, the podcast of the podcast, not this time though, it is NXT Vengeance Day. NXT holds these events with a little bit of sauce and a little bit of flavor just to satisfy some taste buds, hoping that you will watch their product even further. So join me, and as we start in, the product actually opens up this week with a nice little video package hyping up Vengeance Day, and it is featured around Mandy Rose and Toxic Attraction texting each other and talking about showing their titles, girls, and we got the gold, and they're going back and forth in their text messaging, talking and oohing and on over the guys in the matches. I thought it was a very good way of using modern technology in an opening promo, so kudos to them. We then go right into the NXT zone, and we go right into Pete Dunne already in the ring, which was kind of weird. He got kind of a, a jobber's entrance, so to speak. But to be fair, we got a lot to cover, so let's get in. We got, first of all, the weaponized steel cage match, as you guessed, is the first match of the event. It is Tony D'Angelo arriving in a very nice car um, that he probably apparently stole, they said, and he tipped the driver. And then we got Pete Dunne of UK NXT fame. So it is a weaponized steel cage match. All kinds of weapons um, basically tied up to the walls of the cage. And there's just, it looks very like cluttered in the beginning when you get in there. But when you get in there, it's very easy for these guys to grab all these weapons. So the bell rings and Dunn hits an enziguri right away and then throws Tony into the cage. Dunn grabs a steel chair right away, hits D'Angelo twice with it, causing the chair to actually just break. Boom! Right up in the start, we get a smash. And we get a lot of weapons used right away. Dunn grabs a trash can and lifts it above his head, but Tony tackles him. D'Angelo then lifts Dunn and hits the Falcon Arrow onto a trash can. Tony grabs a toolbox off of the cage and then tries to open it up, but Dunn, um, as he tries to open the toolbox, Dunn actually jumps on top of the lid and smashes Tony's fingers in there. The announcers uh, give it the example of being having your fingers closed in a car door, which I've done before. It does not feel good. Dunn pulls out a wrench out of the toolbox and then uses it to b- bend Tony's fingers back. This ties into the story that they've been trying to tell throughout the whole buildup is how they've been manipulating each other's fingers. That's weird when you say it. Then stomps on the elbow. Pete scales the ropes and grabs a cricket bat, but D'Angelo sprays him with a fire extinguisher. D'Angelo then climbs up alongside Dunn, who pulls himself onto the top of the cage. Tony drags Dunn back over the cage, hits a superplex off the top of the cage all the way to the mat. D'Angelo covers, but Dunn kicks out. D'Angelo gets cable ties from the toolbox and ties Dunn's hands behind his back. This is now, even in the odds, with a Tony D'Angelo and Pete Dunn, who's a little more experienced, but now he's literally got both hands behind his back. D'Angelo gets a hammer and uses it to claw and pull at uh, Pete Dunn's teeth. Ow! Dunn kicks D'Angelo and jumps onto the him with a triangle chokehold. His arm's still tied behind his back. D'Angelo lifts Dunn and slams him to break the submission and then hits a DDT for a near fall. Tony wants to powerbomb Dunn through the table but gets caught with a guillotine chokehold. They fall over and they're locked in this submission. Dunn manages to saw through the cable ties with his free hands and some tools that he grabs out of the toolbox. And then... As they free, D'Angelo crawls to the corner, grabs his favored crowbar that was hiding over there, and Dunn basically kicks him in the back. Then power bombs through the table in the corner. But D'Angelo kicks out, Tony grabs the crowbar, and Dunn stands on his hands and then hits him with a cricket bat, boom, right across the back. Ole, ole, ole. Dunn hits Tony with a bitter end and covers. He kicks out. Dunn grabs the crowbar and looks to hit Tony and gets caught in the nuts with an uppercut. Tony quickly lifts Dunn and hits a fisherman suplex. This is awesome. This is awesome chant throughout the arena. Dunn crawls to the corner of the cage and pulls the crowbar of his own onto the ring. Dunn hits Tony with the crowbar, then lands a second bitter end. One, two, three, on the broken furniture for the win. Winner and the weaponized steel cage master, Pete Dunn. Overall, I feel like this was a very spot, um, it was a spot fest for this match. We have 
a lot of clutter in the ring. And you can tell the guys were going through the motions and just hitting different spots. It was definitely spotty. Um, what I would definitely say is, you know, for me, it didn't do as much. Like, while there was a lot of cool spots in action, not really something that, you know, I felt told a real story about how this is going to go. So, certain people are going to like this match just because of all the spots. Me, personally, I like a little bit of flow to my story. And this just did not grab me for some reason. I like Pete Dunne. I've seen his work quite a bit. Um, Tony D'Angelo is a little bit newer to me and he's up and coming, but ultimately I would say this one is probably a pass. Um, just with these steel cage matches, I think the steel cage is enough and all the weapons in there being, it just looked like clutter. I did like the fact that they added a, uh, cricket bat, you know, kind of representing the whole NXT UK vibe from Pete Dunne and, you know, that game and that sport of cricket. So I like that they added something like that instead of just the standard trash cans and, kendo sticks and chairs and tables so we at least got a little bit of something related to pete done that you feel like he would have brought to this fight all right so then in the backstage we get a lot of backstage segments in this show this evening we get cora jade in bed and she gets a call from raquel gonzalez raquel tells jade that she has to get up at 5 a.m to train jade isn't happy about it and she goes along with it and gonzalez to the training center it's a pretty funny little video package you could tell they're just on different levels and this whole build-up is to show that the dusty Rhodes tag team women's cup is going to be coming in the coming weeks in nxt and you should watch that's what they're trying to show you and sell to you so this looks like a team you're going to see a theme for this throughout the night Let's go ahead and speaking of teams, let's get into the feature team, which is the NXT Women's Tag Team Championship, Toxic Attraction with Mandy Rose versus Indy Hartwell and Persia Perota. So before the match can even begin, Gigi and JC actually attack the challengers. They knock them out of the ring and they dive off the apron onto both of them. Back inside the match that gets underway and Persia's booting Jane and tagging in Indy. Hartwell sends JC to the apron and kicks her in the face and Indy gets back into the corner set up on top. Then Dolan gets tagged in. Hartwell starts fighting back from the top rope, but Mandy Rose gets on the apron and causes a big distraction, allowing Jane and Dolan to knock Hartwell off the top rope. The referee caught the cheating from Mandy and ejected, you're out of here, Mandy, from the ringside. Mandy and the fans are furious at the referee. Gigi starts kicking Hartwell in the face, and Rose reluctantly leaves the ringside. We get a commercial break, and then once we're back, we get back live, and Hartwell dodges a kick from Jane and jabs her in the face. Both women take each other down, then crawl to the corners to make tags. Persia drops Dolan with clotheslines, then snake eyes to the corner with a German suplex. Perota attacks an incoming Jane, then lifts her and Gigi onto the shoulders and lands a Samoan drop for a near fall. Indy tags in and combines with Persia for a double team spine buster to the mat in a near fall. Perota knocks Jane out of the ring and runs at her, but JC does a little quick sidestep and Persia hits the steel steps. Hartwell gets on the apron and looks for a springboard, but JC trips her and she falls onto the ring. Dolan hits the question mark kick for the near fall. Jane tags in and hits a double team with GG on Indy for the win. And the winners and still female champions, Toxic Attraction. All right, so this match, again, it was very quick, very fast. There wasn't a lot to tell in this story. Um, I felt like it didn't match up to the buildup that was done. Um, you know, the referee was very quick to get rid of Mandy Rose for interfering in this matchup. I respect the fact they wanted it to be a straight-up final feud between these two. But, um, you know, to me, it was quick. It happened. It wasn't bad. I felt like when you were watching this match, you were really just watching the highlights of it and not the story they were really wanting to tell. So, uh, for me, I don't know. I just I feel like it just nothing's grabbed me yet tonight. But, you know what? It's okay because coming up next, we got a backstage segment. Oh, no, we have a backstage segment that is sure to put you to sleep. It's Wendy Chu, and she's walking with Amari Miller backstage, and she asks her if she'd like to team up for the tag team Dusty Rhodes Classic. Did you hear what's going on? Miller says that she's really sorry, but she already has a partner. Chu then runs into Dakota Kai and asks if she would like to be her partner, and Kai is too busy talking to her imaginary friend to respond. All right, so Gracie, uh, we're going to build up with this Wendy Chu thing, right? Um, she's memorable, but again, it's just the sleepy girl routine and, um, you know, nobody wants to be Wendy's partner, right? Cause she's a little odd and weird and, you know, needs to wake up and realize that her character is not getting over with the backstage crew. All right. So then after this, we get another little backstage segment with 
Brooke Jensen and Josh Briggs. They're at a bar and Jensen tells Briggs about his date with Caden Carter and apparently Caden paid for herself and told him, oh, she's like a little brother. He was just like a little brother to her. Ouch. Can anybody say Planet Friend Zone? Jensen then thinks about it was a good day, but Briggs calls the bartender over who looked to be a wrestler in a way and he told him um, and told her the situation. She told Jensen that he's totally friend zoned. So that was kind of the little backstage bar segment. And then we get a final segment with Grayson Waller and L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight comes to the ring before he can speak. He's interrupted by Grayson Walker, uh, Waller and his police officers with him. And Waller instructs them to arrest Knight. Um, he says that he has no other choice. And he shows footage of being attacked despite having a restraining order during the whole AJ Styles thing that apparently happened a few weeks ago on NXT. So I look at it. And then we did the whole restraining order routine and it was back and forth. And it was like, well, that's not how we do it in Australia. Oh, that's how we do it in America. And it just kind of came off a little silly, but I know they're trying to advance the storyline. And, you know, from that point, you know, we get the whole police interaction. There's a beat down in the corner. Um, Sanga comes down the ramp. You remember Sanga? He was wrestling last week on NXT, made his debut. Big guy, right? Knocks, uh, he knocks him off the apron and throws Waller over the ropes, but Sanga catches him. Knight tells Waller that they're going one on one, you guessed it, next week. So you got to tune in again. All right, then after that, we get another set, final segment um, with Persia Perota and Indy Hartwell. And they're backstage, kind of beating themselves up over the loss. But then all of a sudden, Dexter Loomis shows up. And the one ditches the other. And then from there, uh, they go off and then we get a commercial break. Wish we'd have a break from the backstage segments, but we don't. Uh, we come back, we do get a guy I like. We got Tommaso Ciampa, who cuts a promo, old school style, backstage, talking about what it was like when he was on Monday Night Raw this past week. And they think that he's been hanging out in some developmental brand. I hate to tell you, it is the developmental brand in NXT. But anyway, he sees it in their eyes. Uh, they make a mistake of his loyalty. Uh, don't make a stake of his loyalty for fear and he's sure that Dolph Ziggler will be watching the championship tonight so we get all of this leading to that big old Dolph Ziggler match speaking of matches let's get back to the action we get the North American title with Carmelo Hayes and Cameron Grimes so these two enter the ring Carmelo um Carmelo Hayes has a lot of charisma and a lot of athleticism and he's got a nice little title to show why you know they put that on him you got Cameron Grimes, who I feel like I, they've went through multiple like rebrandings with him, with the top hat and then all this other stuff. Um, I've seen him bits and pieces, right? He's got charisma, he's got some factor, but I just I don't see him an it factor with you know any of these guys. Like they might be able to develop into something. I do think Carmelo Hayes has a little bit more. Uh, Carmelo Hayes also brings his manager Trick Williams. So let's get into this matchup. The match gets underway, and both guys talk trash to each other. They lock up, and Hayes grabs a headlock and forces uh, Grimes to the ropes, but they walk up again, and Grimes grabs the back, but Hayes backs him up to the corner. Grimes avoids an elbow and takes him down with an arm submission. Hayes fights up and grabs a front face lock. Grimes drops him with the shoulder tackle and then dodges him and taunts him, and Hayes gets angry, and Grimes clobbers him um, overall and sends Hayes to the outside. He then looks at, to kick um, Hayes but gets caught and tripped. Hayes gets back on the inside and hits an enziguri to Grimes in the corner, who then does a springboard leg drop. We then get a commercial break. And while I'm doing a quick commercial break, just wanted to break here and say thank you guys for liking and so, or subscribing to the channel or both. I appreciate you. It helps me out a lot. Let's get back into the, from the break to the action. Back live, Hayes is holding Grimes with a submission. They start trading back and forth until Grimes hits a Frankensteiner. Um, Grimes connects with some lariats and counters with a tilt -a whirl and a really crazy sidewalk slam. So then they go back and forth. Hayes hits kind of a code breaker and then the springboard for a near fall. Hayes wastes time posing and taunting and then allowing Grimes to super kick for a near fall of his own. Grimes kicks Hayes in the chest a few times. He slams him. This is where Trick Williams kind of gets up on the apron. Trick Williams um, heads to the top and he wants – basically to hit like some flying crossbody near, you know, for a near fall. Um, so Trick Williams keeps getting involved in this match, and he keeps distracting and getting up and doing all kinds of things through the match. You're going to see that, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Hayes basically then rolls in the ring and then basically tricks, you know, 
Um, Trick basically gets caught up with Hayes a little bit, and there's some distraction there. And then Carmelo runs into Grimes in the barricade. So on the outside, Carmelo takes Grimes, throws him into the barricade, and then we get hit in the back of the ring. And it's a tilt worst slam for a near fall. The champion grabs a bulldog choke and grabs and Grimes tries crawling to the bottom rope. But just then, Trick Williams pulls the rope away from him right as the referee is staring right at him. And there's no disqualification or nothing. Grimes rolls over and tries to pin Hayes, forcing him to kick out and releases the submission. Hayes drops Grimes before going for the top rope. And Hayes hits Grimes with a flying famous serve for the one, two, three, and the win. So this matchup... Um, you know, kind of counteracted the first matchup earlier in the night with uh, Mandy Rose getting thrown out by the refs really quick. And then this one, the referee seemed to just kind of let him do whatever he wanted to do with Trick, uh, Trick Williams. And to the point, he deliberately watched him cheat and did nothing for the man, right? He didn't throw him out. And I get that they're championship matches, and you either let them go a little bit or you, you know, you kind of resolve it. I guess they're going to play into its whole, it's the NXT's, call of the referees to you know handle the match but for me i just the consistency of that was just a little too weird so we get a commercial break and just for the record um this match really didn't do anything to grab me in either uh good back and forth i just don't know what it is about these guys that just doesn't grab me in um i just don't know if it's a mesh between the two of them so we get a commercial break and guess what we get kaylee ray and io shirai backstage and guess what they're promoting the dusty women's classic right and shirai is getting you know, some angry and uh, Kaylee Ray takes her bright neon green baseball bat and shows her how to smash a bunch of mugs and glass. And then Zoe Stark shows up and Eos says that she likes Stark and tells her off to a better start than she was. So at that point, you know, okay, we got the women's classic. So speaking of classics, though, we got the Dusty Rhodes classic finals, MSK for versus the Creed brothers. And I tell you what, this is where business about is about to pick up. Okay, we get a finals match. We get a really good look at two good young tag teams in NXT. So let's go ahead and start in. We get the match underway with Carter and Brutus with the Creed brothers out grappling Nash. Julius tags in and whips Nash into Brutus for a fireman carry into the buckle. Julius grabs the back, but Carter elbows himself free. Lee tags in and MSK hits a flurry of double team strikes. Then Brutus comes through the ropes, but the referee stops him. Julius rolls outside and Lee taunts Brutus then runs and dives over the ropes onto Julius. Julius gets back in and tackles Lee, then dumps him onto the rope gut first. Lee regroups on the apron, but Julius runs and tackles him, sending Lee caressing, bam, right into the announcer desk. MSK is down on the floor as the Creed brothers are just posing in the ring. We hit a commercial break. That was a good, if you have to do a commercial break, that's a good high spot with a nice move just to get people to go to the commercial so you want to see come back and see what's going on. So if you have to do it, not that I'm a fan of the commercial breaks, that's the way you do it. So Brutus is mounted and we come back on Lee, delivering a Hulk, you know, style hammer fist. Lee escapes to the corner and Brutus dives at him, but Lee moves and Brutus hits the buckle. Lee tags Nash and Julius, comes out on the other side. Carter lands a series of lariats and death lifts him for a German suplex. Then super kicks Brutus off the apron. Nash goes to the apron, hits a moonsault where Lee shoves him onto the path of Brutus. Back inside, Lee gets the tag, and Nash gets uh, knocks Brutus right off the apron, allowing Lee to hit the spinning plancha for a near fall. MSK double teams Julius, and Nash hits the super kick off a catapult, and then a double stomp on Brutus breaks the pen attempt, and all four men are down in the ring. Okay, Brutus kicks Lee halfway across the ring, and then Carter knees Brutus in and out of the ring. We got a lot of back and forth action. Everybody's kind of everywhere. Julius catches a flying Carter on the floor and hits a crazy rolling slam. Julius gets Nash back inside and clotheslines him for the win. One, two, three, the Creed brothers, and your new Dusty Rhodes Classic 2022 finalist winners. The Creed Brothers are the 2022 Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic winners. That's a mouthful with Malcolm Bivens in disbelief on the floor that his members of Diamond Mine have shined. I will say I enjoyed this match. It was a right amount of time given for this match. It had a nice little buildup with the tournament style. 
And I will say, MSK is a very athletic tag team. They look like they mesh well. They don't look like, you know, much at first, but they do really, you know, kind of pop a little bit. And then you got the Creed brothers, who this is a bona fide tag team. These guys are real life brothers. And these guys have, you know, obviously have chemistry and they are building and they look like a cohesive tag team. So that means they are going to get a title shot at the current tag team champions. And I can't wait to talk about that here in a minute. And I will, but first we have a backstage segment. So we get another vignette that's, you know, very cringe for Nikita Lyons, who's singing and is really rough and her acting. I don't know what she's kind of going to go do here at NXT, but you know what? We'll see. Hopefully it's not another Wendy Chu type thing. Um, then we get Imperium in the ring. Okay. And then they're in the ring and the fans chant Walter, Walter, right? Cause he's Walter to us. He's not Gunther, but anyway, Gunther tells them how to pronounce his name. Fabian congratulates the Creed brothers and he says they've earned an opportunity at their tag titles, but that's all they have. Marcel says to understand what Imperium is all about, you must endure suffering and anguish and that they are not prepared for. Gunther says Marcel and Fabian have brought pride and sophistication to NXT and now it is his time. I am loving the Imperium versus the Creed Brothers concept. I think that's just going to be a great tag match. So I like the, how they built this with a little bit of a in-between promo work. So at this point, Walter, or I mean Gunther, whatever you want to call him, is you know interrupted, of course, in classic promo f- style by none other than the youngest Uso brother, Solo Sokoa. And the fans chant, Uso, Uso. Solo says he gets it. And the mat is sacred, and he doesn't give a damn about it. On the island, they find the biggest dude, and they slap the taste out of his mouth in order to climb the ladder. And that's about what he's about to do, looking right at Gunther. He doesn't care how he pronounces his name. He's about to wipe the floor with the ring general and make him his bitch. Gunther holds Ochner and Barthol back, and Sokoa then leaves. I like how they're using Sokoa. I like this idea of Gunther versus Sokoa. Um, I think this big man versus kind of big man, little man body type thing can work. Um, I'd be interested to see kind of what they put together with these two. So yes, please. It's got me interested. All right. So we get another little quick commercial break. And after that, we get Trick Williams backstage and, you know, a little bit of just kind of post-match stuff there. But the other thing I wanted to hone in on they did here real quick was the Dolph Ziggler's interviewed uh, backstage about the last night on Raw where he showed up. Um, and then it was just, you know, he says Ciampa came to Raw on his own diamond, probably somewhere in the back of the plane. And he got a nice picture of himself in a big show. Uh, Dolph says Ciampa calls his calls NXT his home. Well, next week he's coming to his home. He's busting out the door and drinking his milk before he kicks his ass. So you get Dolph doing Dolph type things. And here we have, we now have a match ready to go and it's going to happen next week on NXT you're going to get Dolph Ziggler versus Ciampa um, again I think the build is going to be pretty good and I think those two might be able to put together something kind of fun all right now it's time for the main event it's the NXT championship Braun Breaker versus Santos Escobar this is Braun Breaker's first title defense since winning the NXT championship and he gets a major entrance with the whole Vengeance logo in the street catching fire and him standing in front of it and then walking out to the ring, which was a kind of cool spot. The main event is underway as they both in the ring and they lock up, but Escobar can't move Breaker. Braun forces him to the corner and Santos tried to push him, but again, he doesn't budge. Breaker shoves Santos across the ring. Breaker grabs a side headlock and Escobar eventually shoots him off, but gets dropped with a shoulder tackle. Escobar sends him to the ropes and this time catches the rookie with a drop kick. Breaker performs a gator roll right into a stalling vertical suplex and then kips up and the fans start barking a lot of Steiner style. I like that whole move set with the gator roll, the suplex. That's just a nice little fit for him. So I think that's a good chain wrestle move uh, for him to kind of keep doing. Escobar rolls the outside regroups, but Legato break um, with Legato but Breaker uh, chases after him. Santos tries to get him as he gets in the ring, but Braun ducks it and connects with a powerful clothesline. He's definitely a power wrestler at that. Breaker shoulder tackles Santos into the corner a few times, and this hits a rib breaker. Joaquin Wilde gets on the apron, and Breaker moves towards him, allowing Santos to knock him off the apron. 
Escobar connects with a suicide dive and runs Breaker into the steel steps. Boom! And then back in the ring, Escobar hits a neck breaker for a two count. Escobar goes to the apron and drags Braun Breaker through the ropes to hit a neck breaker and then taunts the crowd. Santos hits a senton for a one, two, and a kick out. Then Breaker, and then he puts Breaker in the corner. Braun turns the tables and lands a series of rights and lefts, right, left, right to the gut. But Santos drops him with a well-placed boot to the jaw. Escobar gets Breaker in the corner again and hits a double knee for a near fall. Santos drags Breaker under the bottom rope onto the steel steps. And Breaker then applies a Boston Crab old school style on the steps. Forcing Braun's head against the ring post, Escobar gets Braun back inside and lands a few punches and does a bow and arrow stretch. Escobar trash talks and tells Braun this is his time. He looks for a big right hand, but Breaker grabs it and lands a punch of his own. We go back and forth with a lot of crazy action. And then we get into the third act of this match. And at this point, um, Elector Lopez at one point, more interference. You notice the interference uh, factor again tonight. Again, the referee just kind of allowed all this to happen in another championship match. Elector Lopez tries to get in the ring. And the referee is, of course, distracted. Suddenly, Dolph Ziggler appears and super kicks Breaker. Santos crawls over and makes the pin, but Breaker kicks out. Dolph tries to get back in the ring, and Ciampa appears and drags him back out. And they brawl to the backstage inside the ring. Escobar readies himself in the corner and waits for Breaker to get free. Escobar hits a running tornado DDT for a nearby fall. Escobar goes to the top rope, pays tribute to Eddie Guerrero style, and looks for a frog splash. But Breaker rolls out of the way. And Breaker connects with a huge spear and then military presses and power slams for the one, two, and the three, the win, and the still champion, Braun Breaker. That is everything for the NXT Vengeance Day uh, pay-per-view or event, whatever you would like to call it. Let's go over some final thoughts here. So overall, I feel like they did a good job with presentation. I They did a good job with the before in post-match interview segments, I feel like they did a really nice job. You don't see that on the main roster a lot. So I like the way that, you know, it lets us to kind of get to know these guys a little bit and check their promo skills out. Um, here's what to watch. If you guys really want to shorten up your time and not watch the whole two-hour event, check out the tag match in the Dusty Rhodes final and check out, check out Braun Breaker in the NXT championship match. I would say those are the must-watches of the night. The rest of them could be missed, and you could save yourself a lot of time because I just feel like there wasn't anything else, and this definitely was a two-match show for me. Future uh, match buildup was done very nicely on the show. Ciampa versus Ziggler. Yes, please. I'm kind of looking forward to that. And then the Creed Brothers versus Imperium. I may want to check that one out a little bit. And Solo Sokoa versus Walter. So they're doing a good job with the buildups here and then also introducing the Dusty Rhodes Classics. Um, it's a little weird that they're building up so much future matches at what's supposed to be equal to their pay-per-view takeover style shows. And this was supposed to be the payoff for a lot of feuds. And I feel like it just didn't do the job there. So those are my thoughts. But you know what? Let me know yours either here down below or on Twitter. It's all good either way. And I just want to say thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. And as we say around here, it's not goodbye. It's game over.